All right, today we're going to talk about, for the next 45 minutes or so, the significance of Paul. Why is it that Paul is such a big deal? All right, um, and so let's talk about that a little bit. First, you've seen Paul. Um, first, let's say, let's just say, Orthodox Christianity, when I say Orthodox Christianity, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox. Orthodox uh, is, the Greek word Orthodox means right belief. So whenever you say Orthodox Christianity, it means the Christianity that has it right, because there's a lot of, a lot of versions of the Christian faith that don't have it right. So um, true Christianity, or correct right belief Christianity, relies heavily on the teachings of Paul, believing them to be explanations and amplifications on the teaching of Jesus. Now that's very important. Those of us who are evangelical, or those of us who take Scripture seriously, would, would say that Jesus taught, you know, met Paul on the road to Damascus, a miraculous uh, interaction that they had, where he fell off his horse, was blinded, was taken into the city of Damascus, and then uh, Ananias was sent by God to heal him of his blindness and teach him the first basics about Christianity. Well, from Ananias on, all the other people, the Barnabas, uh, many others that Paul interacted with, no doubt God used them to teach him more and more. But Paul also tells us that he was miraculously called up into the, the heavens and was taught. And so he had a miraculous understanding of that. So Orthodox Christianity believes that all that Paul wrote is a, an explanation and an enlargement, not a, not a change on, but an, an unfolding of the basic beliefs that were taught by Jesus. And that it is Jesus who both saved Paul and sent Paul, that he is a messenger of God. And then that reason is one of the most important figures. In fact, I've said to you before, I think, there have every year they do a survey of who's the most important figure in history, the most influential figure in history. Well, several times Paul has been named the most influential person in history because many people believe that he is responsible for creating Christianity. That there is somehow a chasm, a break in between the Jesus, the historical Jesus who taught, and the doctrines that Paul teaches. In fact, some propose that Pauline Christianity, and that term, I have quotes around it because that's a particular technical term, that Pauline Christianity is different from the original teachings of Jesus. That he introduces doctrine and themes that are not consistent with Jesus. Now, um, I mentioned here uh, Jesuism or Jesusism. That actually is a movement which says, forget Paul, let's go back to Jesus. Based on the idea that Jesus and Paul are not compatible. Now, my belief, our belief, is that Paul was guided by God to go deeper into explaining things to us than Jesus, but that it's not inconsistent, that it is completely consistent. Jesus did not talk a lot about the doctrine of the atonement, for instance, when he was alive. The atonement is a major feature of Paul's writing, how it is that we are saved by the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Well, um, there are places where Jesus referred to the fact that he came to save and Paul gives us a much more uh, deeper understanding, a much broader understanding of that. But some propose that what Paul wrote, wrote the, the 13 books of Paul, are too far beyond what Jesus said to be identified as being a continuation or an expansion on those. Okay? Now, yes? Of course, uh, uh, to avoid those, can you, have you got some names? I mean, are they contemporary? Uh, are we talking about yes. people that publish today? Most of them are modern. Now, you have to be very careful because I'm going to talk in a minute about um, there, there has been a, a new movement um, which, is, which includes some wonderful um, New Testament evangelical scholars like N.T. Wright, who is great. Well, N.T. Wright is part of a movement that says uh, we need to reevaluate Paul, not on whether or not Paul is consistent with Jesus, that's not what he says, but he says much of what we assume about Paul is based upon interpretations that were made in the Reformation by Luther and Calvin and others. Not, and, and, and movement is to say let's start looking at Paul, not, not to discard that, not like they want to discard the Reformation, but we need to be more aware of Paul in the context of being a first century Jew, 
And much, and it's true, much of what Luther and Calvin did was they interpreted Paul's writing in terms of um, a sort of a reformed theological understanding, whereas N.T. Wright and a lot of others who were still very much followers, you know, believers in Paul, followers of Jesus, they're very committed Christians, they are sort of agreeing that we need to reevaluate that. Now, there's no one movement. In fact, N.T. Wright says there are as many different ideas about this as there are people writing about it, and I disagree with most of them. Okay. If you don't know N.T. Wright, um, he's, he's uh, British, I think he's the British. Bishop of York. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, he's the man who was uh, Anglican. Ang exactly. The Anglican priest yeah. who was captured in uh, Africa for a while. No. no, different right. Yeah, I don't think that's, no, that's not him. Um, and so, he, I mean, his writing is wonderful. And T. Wright is considered one of the best and most evangelical of all the all uh, New Testament theologians today. And yet he agrees that maybe we have misinterpreted Paul to fit with Protestant priorities during the Reformation. Not that those all are necessarily wrong, but we need to regain the part that we maybe lost in the process. I'll talk about that a little bit. So there can be no doubt that Paul had a powerful influence on the development of Christian doctrine and the growth of the early church. But in modern times, there have been questions as to whether the extent of Paul's influence has perhaps been inappropriate, that it's been too much. It's been almost entirely in the 20th century that those sorts of things have come up. But it's in terms of a theological critique of Paul and his place, Pauline Christianity. But, as we were talking about earlier, it's not like it's only been in the 20th century that people question whether or not Paul was accurately representing Jesus. The Ebionites, they said Paul's whole interpretation of the law and his rejection of the law, blah, 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 is a misinterpretation of what Jesus meant. So from, from the time of Paul still being alive, there were people that have questioned that and have questioned it all along. We can't just assume that because that questioning has been happening, that there's necessarily validity to it, and I'll get into that. So um, in terms of theology, we need to understand that uh, Paul interpreted and applied the idea of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah into the view of Jesus as a universal Savior, which is one of the biggest problems the Ebionites had with him. You know, he was preaching to Gentiles. And so he took the idea of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah and expanded it to be available to everybody. The Ebionites, the Nazarenes did not like that idea. Other people since then, you know, have, have thought he went too far in that regard. Because um, Paul, because he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he called himself that because he saw his mission being not exclusively to the Gentiles. Paul did not refuse to preach to Jews. In fact, he always went to the synagogue first when he went into a community. But after he preached in the synagogue, he then went to the public marketplaces and elsewhere to preach to the Gentiles. But he called himself the, the apostle to the Gentiles because he felt a special call to go to places where the Jews were not the majority, where the Jews were the minority. And in one place, he, he's so frustrated with the response to the Jews in the synagogue, he shakes the dust off his clothes and says, forget it, from now on I'm not going to have anything to do with the Jews. Well, the very next event we have where he comes into a new town, he goes straight to the synagogue and preaches to the Jews. He couldn't not preach to the Jewish people. But his primary call, the thing that separated him from most of the other apostles, is he especially felt the call to go to predominantly Gentile cities in Gentile areas of the Roman Empire and preach to them as well. Now, Evangelical scholars, of which I consider myself one, contend that in doing, in, in um, contextualizing Jesus to the Gentile environment as well, not just Jewish, you know, Paul said to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or Greek, um, we believe that Paul was consistent with the Old Testament promise that the Messiah would be given to all nations. When, when God called Abraham, you will remember, God gave Abraham three promises. If you'll follow me, I will make of you a great people. You'll have a lot of kids. I will give you a land to live in. And the third one was, and through you I will bless all the peoples of the earth. He restated that with Isaac. He restated that again with Isaac's son Jacob. And down through the history of the Old Testament, the promise has always been that God would bless all nations of people when the time came. And so... Paul, in presenting Jesus as the Messiah, not just for the Jews, but as the Savior for all people, is completely consistent with the Old Testament testimony about him. In fact, one of the critical parts of Pharisee Jew, Paul's history as a Pharisaic Jew, Paul 
a Pharisee from, from a line of Pharisees, you know, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, and he studied under the great teacher Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of his day, right? Um, the grandson of Hillel, maybe the greatest theologian ever in the history of the church, with a possible argument being made for Maimonides in the 12th century. But um, the idea was that because Paul was so trained in Jewish history and Jewish law and scripture and everything else, he was able to, to accurately portray or present that Jewish history and law in a way that made people understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that. It's the very fact that, that Paul had been a Pharisee meant he could explain how Jesus the Messiah fulfilled the Jewish expectation, but also came for all peoples. Okay? Um, and in that, I, we evangelicals believe that, that Paul did not materially disagree or alter, disagree with or alter the teachings of Jesus. He simply gave us more of an explanation. All right? He gave us the necessary commentary for us to be able to understand all of what it was Jesus both said to us and did for us. More liberal interpreters disagree with that. For instance, Tom Ogolo, a modern biblical uh, critic and interpreter, says, all that is good about Christianity stems from Jesus, all that is bad about it stems from Paul. Mm. Obviously not a very high regard for Paul. <laughs> um, and he's, he, you're writing his name down there, huh, John. Um, he certainly is not alone in that. There are a lot of others who would maintain that Paul was the problem, not the solution, but not evangelicals, okay? And, and again, because part of what happens if you do that is you just cut out 40% of the New Testament. You've just gotten rid of it. And people, preachers who refuse to preach on Paul because they don't like what he said, are discounting the Word of God. And on what then do they base their faith? Just the stuff they like? Well... I like, you know, pistachio ice cream. Is that part of my gospel? If I base it just on what I like or don't like, and yet that's too often the case. Um, no less than Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, claimed that Paul was instrumental in the church's deviation from Jesus' teaching and practices. And again, the Ebionites, some of the early Jewish Christians, would declare that Paul was a false prophet and they said, the Ebionites said, that Paul was more concerned about turning Christians into Romans than he was about turning Jews into Christians. They believed he had a political agenda, in other words, because he was a Roman citizen. Now, um, the real issue, I believe, on how you interpret Christian doctrine as presented by Paul and whether or not Paul distorted Christian doctrine, part of that has to do with how you perceive the canon of scripture having come to be compiled. Um, people who attribute political motivations frequently are those that feel like, you know, it was Constantine and the people in Constantine's time, the 300s, who decided what's in scripture. Without paying attention to the historical fact that by the end of the, before the end of, uh, before the year 200, by the 180s, there was a list of acceptable books that would later become formalized as the canon that were being distributed that include all of the writings of Paul. In fact, even the worst heretics have always had a sense that Paul was the right one. In fact, Marcion, uh, Marcion, one of the most serious threats to the church ever. In fact, our whole push to have the canon defined was partly because Marcion, the heretic, had himself defined a canon, and he said Paul was the only one of the apostles who really understood and got it right. And so it was only the Pauline epistles that he was willing to accept although he chose to edit them. And the only gospel he accepted was, was Luke's, although he edited it very heavily. You know, he decided what part he thought was right. Um, others, um, a professor of German, not theology, but just German, sorry, Bob, G.A. Wells present, uh, first presented the view in the 19th century that Jesus was a mythical figure, not a real historical figure, and that Christianity had been invented by Paul was not a product of Jesus. Now that idea continued, and to some people still hold to it today, although nobody with any sense today will question that Jesus was a historical figure. Nobody does that anymore unless they've got serious problems, like institutionalized problems. No scholar of any merit ever today would suggest that Jesus was not a historical figure. 
Um, but the Tübingen School, which was founded by F.C. Bauer, um, later on Adolf Harnack, all of them would question the, whether or not the influence that Paul had on Christian doctrine was appropriate or had gone too far. Um, some of, quite frequently, the accusation has been made that, that Paul took Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and it was Paul that turned him into the Son of God as a doctrine. Now again, you don't have to study the Gospels very long, if you're being honest about it, to see the number of times that Jesus accepted praise as the Son of God from the people around him. He made claims. Those of you who were in the class yesterday, um, I read, read the passage from uh, C.S. Lewis where he says what, G what Jesus said, the things he did, the way he acted, are unconscionable unless he truly was the Son of God and understood himself to be the Son of God. Okay? But those are the kinds of accusations, and they blame Paul for all of that. Okay, let's talk a little bit more. Um, this is counter to that idea that Paul invented Christianity, if you will, and that the doctrine of the Christian faith has been so reliant upon Pauline theology that it's not, uh, it's not really Jesus-oriented. The uh, early controversies in the Christian church, particularly the 2nd and 3rd century, the things that led to the Nicene, the Council of Nicaea, and all the other ecumenical councils, the, the controversies were Christological and Trinitarian, meaning what is the nature and person of Christ, of Jesus as the Christ, and what is the nature of the Trinity, and how are we to understand that? The Christological and Trinitarian uh, controversies, as they're called, were at the core of all the early development and articulation of Christian doctrine in the post-apostolic period. The Council of Nicaea met specifically to address the issue of, is Jesus co-eternal with the Father, or was he at some point created? And so, all of those issues that come out, Paul's writings do not figure in those debates. So, claiming that Paul was responsible for really creating out of, you know, out of the air, ex nihilo, from nothing, not, not based on Jesus, but upon, based upon what Paul thought, the idea that he created modern Christian theology doesn't make any sense when you realize that Paul's letters were not of any significant import at all in making all of those critical decisions in the first three centuries of the church. Paul doesn't address the issue of, um, of the nature of Christ in the same way. He sort of assumes it. And the, the um, well, as I say here, the most ancient creeds, particularly the Nicene Creed and before that even the Apostles' Creed, don't deal with the primary Pauline doctrines. Paul was concerned with the atonement, with the state of humanity, with our relationship with the law, and with justification by faith, none of which is addressed in the two most ancient creeds, which are the, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are the earliest and most important articulations of what the Christian belief is. What do we believe? What does it mean to be Christian? And yet they don't get into our relationship with the law. They don't get into the, the sinful state of humanity. They're entirely oriented toward telling us what do we believe about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And there's a little bit of eschatology thrown in, you know, that, that we, we look forward to the end time. All right? Paul did not influence that because those are not, Paul didn't focus on that. Okay? Does that make sense? The particular Pauline doctrines that are, that we talk about, and I'm going to look at some of them in a few minutes, they became a focus much later in terms of being embedded in Orthodox Christian doctrine, that is Protestant Orthodox Christian doctrine especially. Uh, Luther, Calvin, the other reformers very much took in, in fact, part of what I think we, we would say is starting with the early creeds of the church up until, you know, for, for 1400 years or so, there was not an emphasis on the basic doctrines that Paul expounds in his writings, and that was part of what Luther and Calvin and other reformers <coughs> made right. There had not been enough emphasis on Paul and Paul's letters. For instance, um, salvation by grace through faith. That's not in the early creeds. And so when Luther and Calvin and others came along and realized the church had gone down a wrong road by not emphasizing that enough, they corrected it by reintroducing much more of the Pauline doctrine, and it is reflected in the later creeds. For instance, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is one of the great of the Protestant confessions, much longer. It has a catechism, a shorter catechism, a longer catechism. There's a lot of Pauline doctrine about original sin 
and about um, atonement and all of that sort of thing embedded in those. So, it's not to say that because the early doctrines of the church didn't include those Pauline theologies does not mean that they weren't right. It simply means that was phase two of understanding Christian doctrine. The first thing they had to do was figure out what's the nature of God and, and the nature of Jesus and the, and the person of Jesus and what is the Holy Spirit all about. Figuring all that out and articulating that in the early ecumenical councils led us to the point where the, the reformers were then free to reintroduce those very critically important aspects of Pauline doctrine into things. All right? um, questions about that? Does that make sense to you in terms of a flow of history? And that's why we don't think that the guys, the people are right who are saying that Paul invented early Christianity. Paul was not nearly as influential as he might have been early on. Yes? Would it be safe to say then that, you know, Paul was the premier uh, commentator of Jesus <laughs> Right. If by commentator you mean to explain. I mean, to I mean explain. it was scripture. It was scripture. But, but his, his ministry explained the majesty and the... Right and the multiple perfections of Christ. And how it fits with us. See, the early creeds don't really deal with the human state. They're entirely focused on the nature of God. I mean, there's like the Nicene Creed has and for our salvation in there, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't explain it anyway. Well, Paul got into that stuff a lot, and later on it gets brought back in. So yes, it's true. Paul is the one who gave us a full understanding of that that was brought in primarily, brought back into our theology primarily in the Reformation, which is one of the reasons we believe the Protestant Reformation was right and so important, is because the church had lost, it's not focused on some of the most critical parts of what the New Testament tells us, right? Now, the entire question then is whether Paul distorted the faith, and that depends entirely on what you perceive to be the true and right path. If you think Paul was correct, in what he had to say, then you don't have any heartburn about this. Okay? And the fact is, today, Roman Catholics, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, Conservative Protestants, and Messianic Jews would all contend that Paul's writings are a legitimate interpretation of the gospel that Jesus presented. Now, you'll notice, I mentioned Catholics, I mentioned uh, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, um, I mentioned Conservative Protestants. The liberal problems that we've had with interpretation of Scripture and denying that it is God's Word and that Paul didn't write half of what Scripture says he wrote and everything else has entirely been the work product of liberal Protestants. Nobody else. It is a liberal Protestant problem. And it is liberal Protestants that question Paul as being legitimate in terms of his interpretation of the Gospel of Christ Versus, did he just invent a new religion and claim that it was from Jesus? Okay. Now, um, I've said before, the Roman Catholic Church stepped on the neck of anybody they felt like doctrinally got out of line. Too much so. I mean, look at the Reform Protestant Reformation. Eastern Orthodoxy has never dealt with these intellectual issues because that's not how they think. They're much more into the spiritual disciplines and less into the rational disciplines. And so, this kind of liberal. Theological interpretation has never been a problem in the Orthodox churches, that is, the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox. Um, and Messianic Jews don't have any problem with it because Paul was talking right to them. It is only the liberal Protestants. Now, many anti-Pauline commentators down through the years, and I include amongst these Frederick Nietzsche, of course the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, God is dead, you know, the will to power, the Ubermensch, all that stuff. Uh, German, by the way. Um, uh, <laughs> and Bertrand Russell, who is English, we'll give you a break there, you know, who's a liberal, you know, a liberal philosopher and commentator. They, among many others, although those two admitted it, they admit that their criticisms are based more on moral objections to Paul's thought than upon theological considerations. In fact, in other words, they don't like that Paul says you can't do certain things. <laughs> um, this is exactly the reason that so many, so many people today would reject Paul is because they don't agree with things he says. There was a minister of one of the churches here in town who's no longer here, so I'm not picking on anybody in town, who refused to preach from any or have read any of the writings of Paul in church because he disagreed. He thought Paul was against women, which I don't think Paul was, and the fact that Paul takes a stand against practicing homosexuality, um, which he does. And because this particular minister disagreed with that, and I'm only using him as an example, he's not the only one in the world, 
because they disagree with those moral questions, what they saw as moral issues, then they don't like Paul at all, and they reject him for those reasons. And sometimes I think it's for entirely those kinds of reasons that people want to reject Paul and his influence, but then they claim that it's for theological reasons, either because they're looking for cover or because they don't really know the difference. Um, the fact is that people, even people who are in sort of the professional religious business, don't often think very well about these things, or very hard about these things. They, they take the easy route. And the road to truth on matters of theology is the hard way. Okay. So, what was the essence of Paul's <laughs> Christian message? It's, it's a very simple sequence of five things, I think, that is the basis for really everything that Paul was about. In his life, in his, in his teaching, in his planting of churches, in his, his writings. First, God sent his son, and his name was Jesus. That's the first and foremost part of it. The incarnation of the divine word of God. He doesn't use the expression word of God, that's John. But, uh, see, a lot of people say that Paul, there's Paul on one side, and there's Peter, John, James, and the other writers on the other side, and they didn't get along. There's no indication of that. Okay? They, for instance, would say that's the reason the book of Galatians doesn't, um, the, the people who hold to this, the northern Galatian theory, you guys remember that? The idea that the book of Galatians, the first of Paul's writing, writings, I don't believe Thessalonians was, some people do, I believe Galatians was, that people who claim that it was the northern historical province of Galatia, back before the Romans came, that Paul was writing the churches he planted up there, at, at when we don't know, they think he planted them in his, his second missionary journey and then wrote to them later, if the northern theory would say that the Galatian churches um, were planted and then Paul wrote back to them the letter of Galatians after the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem specifically decided and determined that Jewish, that, that Gentile believers in Jesus did not have to be circumcised. That was decided and defined by the Council of Jerusalem. That's the whole theme, the whole topic of the book of Galatians, and yet Paul does not refer in the book of Galatians to the fact that the church in Jerusalem, the mother church, the home church, has already decided this issue. Does not make sense to you that if that had already happened, that Paul would have, you know, when he's making this argument, would have said, well, and, and the, the Council of Jerusalem, you know, James, James the Just and the others have already decided this issue, so why is this still bothering you? You don't have to just listen to me. The other leaders of the church have said that. Paul doesn't say that in Galatians, which is why I don't believe, and most people today don't believe that he was writing to the Northern Galatian theory but rather the Southern Galatians, which means the churches that he planted in his first journey he was writing back to before the Council of Jerusalem happened. Okay? So that, but that whole issue of, you know, the, the, how did I tie this into God sent his son? Um, I'm not even sure where I was going with that. But the idea of, um, oh, I know what I was going to say. People who say that Paul was in a, in a dispute, was feuding with all of the other Christians, they maintain the northern Galatian theory, and they say the only reason that Paul did not refer to the fact that the Council of Jerusalem had decided that issue is that Paul didn't like them and wouldn't agree with them and did not want to quote them as an authority. He wanted to rely entirely on his own authority because he didn't get along with those guys. There's no indication of that. Okay? They're so creative. Oh, man, we come up with some great ideas. And so that idea that, that Paul, you know, Paul was on one side and everybody else was on the other side, and so... You can't pay too much attention to Paul. But back to his message. God sent his son, his name was Jesus. That son was crucified for the benefit of humanity to take away our sin. Third, the son, Jesus, will return, and he will return soon. Paul clearly did believe that Jesus was going to return in his life. Now, he didn't present that as a statement of doctrine. You know, there's no, doctor, there's no theological uh, upset to be taken from the fact that Jesus did not return. Paul was not omniscient. He didn't know everything. Um, what he presents to us as the truth, we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired him to give. Paul doesn't say, Jesus is going to be coming back by next Tuesday, and if he doesn't, then none of this makes any sense. He doesn't, you know, there's none of that. So the fact that Jesus did not come back in his lifetime, even though Paul expected it, is not a, is not a theological problem. But fourth, those who by faith, Paul, this again, remember this is Paul's Christian message. Those who by faith belong to the Son would live with him forever. So if by faith we have accepted Jesus and therefore are in Christ, and I'll mention that in this in a minute, 
to be in Christ, to belong to Him, that we would live with the Son forever, and that His followers, while we are still on the earth, are called to live by the highest moral standards. Now, Paul was very clear that it's not living by high moral standards that gets you saved. You're saved by the grace of Christ as you accept Him. As Paul says in Romans, um, if, you believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning that He is God, and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. There's nothing in there about doing good works. But once we have been saved, we are expected to live a moral life. In fact, Paul is very consistent with James, no matter what Luther got wrong. Sorry, Luther. Um, they're not inconsistent. There's not a problem there. Because Paul in places is very clear that if we aren't saved in Christ, we have obligations. And the obligations are that we live a moral life. That we're obedient to the requirements of righteousness. Again, not that that will get us saved, but that we have an obligation as much out of gratitude as anything else. Okay? So those five points really are at the core of all of Paul's theology. God sent his son. That son was crucified for the benefit of humanity. He would return. Those who by faith belong to him would live with him forever. And while we are here waiting for him, we, his followers, are obligated to live by a high moral standard. Now, there are major themes that come up in Paul's theology. I mentioned already the atonement, the idea of how it is that Christians are redeemed by the, by, from the law by Jesus' death and resurrection. The issue of the atonement is interwoven into everything that Paul writes about. How is it that we are saved by the sacrifice of Christ? And again, that's not anything that got dealt with theologically in the first three centuries of the church. Even more than that, probably. Second, he dealt a lot with the importance of being in Christ. That, that expression occurs like 179 times, I think it is, 174, 179 times, in the writings of Paul. To be in Christ is his shorthand for the fact that we have accepted him, we are part of his body, we are to be with him forever. So in Christ is like a two-word summary of Paul's whole theology. It sort of sums up the first five points, which are the false Christian message, that we are in Christ. Paul also dealt a great deal with the relationship with Judaism. Um, Judaism, Paul was, was proud and pleased to be Jewish. And he saw Jesus as being the completion of the promise made to the Jews, the fulfillment of God's promise to the Jewish people, which is why he said that Jesus was for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Second, secondly, still, but secondly. And yet, he felt that Jesus, in coming and sacrificing himself, did away with the sacrificial requirements, the, the ritualistic requirements of the Old Testament law. Now, we still were required to obey the moral law. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie about your neighbors, etc. We still have that obligation. But none of the ritual parts of the law, especially the sacrificial parts, any longer held us. And so in that way, he maintained that Judaism was now obsolete, at least the law. Now, the interesting thing is that when you talk about Paul's relationship with Judaism, there are three different, very different kinds of approaches to this. The, some of them see Paul, or Saul as he started out as, being completely in line with Judaism. Because he was a Pharisee, a student of Gamaliel, and he saw Jesus as the Messiah who fulfilled the promise to God. Some people would say, that's completely consistent with a first century Jew. But a first century Jew who believed that God has fulfilled his promise and sent the Messiah like he always said he would. There's a second group of people who see him as anti-Semitic. As so much against Judaism that he, you know, he appears to, to hate the Jews in some people's interpretation. I don't see where they get that. But some people would go so far as to say he's anti-Semitic. And I'm going, uh, Paul the Pharisee, really? <laughs> but some people see him as being so anti-Jewish law that he becomes anti-Jew, and in that way, Semitic. And then there's a third group who see him as falling somewhere between those two extremes. Again, being against the ritual laws, but in favor, and, and that's exemplified by the Council of, you know, he was the primary, one of the primary witnesses at the Council of uh, Jerusalem in Acts 15. It was him and Peter and Barnabas, apparently, were the primary people speaking against requiring circumcision. And so in that regard, that's an example of Paul being against the ritual law of circumcision and dietary law and all that. And yet, 
he still maintains, as in the book of Romans, that there is a divine law that is represented in Christ Jesus. That we still have the obligation to fulfill the, um, the clean, cleansing from our sins, but we don't do it with sacrificed animals. We do it by accepting the grace of Jesus Christ, who is the sacrifice once for all. And so there is a, a, a divine, a Christian law, if you will, that is the new covenant that you still are obligated to. So there are completely opposite views of where Paul stands in his relationship with Judaism. Clearly, he did identify that the Jewish idea of being made righteous by fulfilling the legal obligations of the Mosaic Law was no longer binding on humanity. Um, and because of that, because of denying the necessity of following the ritualistic aspects of the Mosaic Law and identifying Jesus as being the divine Son of God, Paul, without intending to, I honestly don't think this was Paul's desire because that's why he went to synagogues everywhere he went, Paul became a major cause of the eventual and utter split between early Christianity and Judaism. Now again, Jesus was Jewish, the early apostles were Jewish, all of the early believers were Jewish, earliest believers were Jewish. There is no way a Christian can be anti-Semitic if, if, they're, if they're thinking at all. all right? Ours, we are adopted into the Jewish family. We are grafted, as Paul said, onto the vine which is the chosen people of God. And so he was not anti-Semitic, but he did say God has done a new thing. He has fulfilled all of those things by sending his son Jesus. But so many Jews could not accept the divinity of Jesus, and they could not accept the fact that Mosaic Law was no longer binding. Then Paul was the one that sort of drove that final wedge in, even though that was not his intention. We do have to acknowledge that to be true. Okay. John? Uh, I was just going to add, the, 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 you were talking about how Paul um, was accused of being anti-Semitic because he rejected the law. In Ephesians 2, 15 talks about by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained or expressed, in this he says, in ordinances. That was that was what his contention was, was right. that the ordinances did not save you. Right. I go back to the moral law that was embraced and enhanced. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I've got new perspectives here. Again, I mentioned N.T. Wright, and there are others. There are both liberal scholars and evangelical scholars who really do say that we have gone too far in following Luther and Calvin. And again, I'm nobody's a bigger fan of Calvin than Luther than I am. But given their historical circumstance and their need to establish authoritatively from Scripture, and in that case it means from Paul's writings in Scripture, the alternative to what they saw as being the problems of the Catholic Church in the, in the 16th century, then they looked very, very heavily toward Paul and interpreted theology in the context of Paul in the 16th century and took us, you know, and was trying, they were trying to write the ship because it was, it was going over. And so it was not inappropriate or incorrect, but now, you know, 500 years later, we look at that and say that we probably did in the last 500 years. We have not paid enough heed to how we should understand Paul as having been a first century Jew, speaking to, first initially, Jewish people in the first century and then to Gentiles. There is some parts of that that we probably left off. And again, no less scholars, evangelical scholars than N.T. Wright and others, are saying we need a new perspective. And in fact, there is you can look up new pers Pauline perspective, <coughs> And Wright was the one who said, it's not one perspective, there's many perspectives, and, I, and as many as the people writing about this, and I disagree with most of them. And so the whole idea is we need to make sure that we are giving Paul a, a complete uh, reading and not just interpreting him the way the Reformers did. Okay? And that's not unfair, and it's not anti-biblical. It's not anti-Paul even. We're trying to give him more credibility and not less. I apologize for interrupting so much, but... Uh, I, I really respect N.T. Wright. Mm -hmm. But what's the difference between new perspectives and biblical theology that takes on theology from a historical perspective? Can you delineate the difference well, between these two? There's always a danger given a particular historical orientation. And our particular historical orientation is as Protestants in, in the, you know, descended from the Protestant Reformation. Wright and others are simply saying, let's make sure that we've not allowed ourselves to descend from the Reformation thinking 
without realizing that maybe we need to go back 1,500 years earlier and pay a little closer attention to what the context was that Paul spoke in, not the interpretation that Luther and Calvin spoke to. Okay? So it's not really either or. They're, they're recommending, they're not saying get rid of Luther, get rid of Calvin, but they're saying let's make sure that we're giving Paul his full credit for being a first century Jew dealing with the, the context and environment he was in. And so, again, they call it the New Pauline Perspective. Most of the people involved in this New Pauline Perspective are probably liberal interpreters. And that's, it's, that's code for them saying, you know, Paul tried to, Paul created a new religion and it's not really the religion of Jesus. Okay. But there are very le legitimate evangelical scholars involved in this New Perspectives, and most people say it needs to be plural because there's not just one, um, that we, we haven't given Paul all of his due. Rather than say something less about him, like he wasn't really teaching what Jesus taught, let's give him more credit and say, let's make sure we were, full, were fully aware of what it was he was addressing when he was alive. Okay? Um, and so you can look up New Pauline Perspective in, you know, in, in the inter interwebs or whatever you know, and find commentary on that. We also have Paul's major theme of the human fallen state and need for grace. Uh, and again, this is not addressed in the really in the early, earliest creeds. This was not an early theological discussion in the church. And so you can't blame Paul you know, for those are the early creeds because the fall and our need for grace is, is not addressed in Apostles and Nicene Creed, for instance. And yet that was a major focus of his writing. Our own fallen state and the, and the only means by which we can recover from that, which is by the grace of Christ. You know, by, faith, by grace you are saved through faith. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians. Okay. Um, and, and the extent to which that's true, uh, you know, I just quoted Ephesians, and yet Galatians is seen, Galatians was, is, was called the Magna Carta of the, of the Reformation, Protestant Reformation, because Galatians is the one that Luther especially looked to more than any other as establishing the fact that we are saved by grace. As, as received in faith, not by works. But again, it's throughout all of Paul's writings, because I just quoted you the same thing from Ephesians. All right? Um, and then the person and work of Christ. Again, Jesus is the focus of everything Pauline, to be in Christ, the person and nature and work of Christ. Now, Paul did write about that, but it, interestingly enough, it was not primarily Paul that was being referred to in the, early, the writing of the early creeds and early doctrines of the church. They dealt much more with uh, John, for instance. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When they're trying to figure out the nature, the nature of the person of Christ, it wasn't primarily Paul that they looked. He didn't influence that to that extent. Okay. Any questions about any of this? Paul makes a difference. And I think he's a really good guy. Okay. I, have, I have such a problem. With Paul. Okay, why is that? I have a problem with him because he was so instrumental. Half I am, no, I said this before, half the Bible of the New Testament part, and he disappears. And you said that he wasn't really that important, but gosh, if you disappeared, somebody would know what happened to you. There would be rumors. I mean, stories have gone down through history saying what happened if somebody died or or well we have that, stories that came down through history no, but, but you're saying that it isn't exact we have a thought that he might have come back with Nero or whatever and been and that might have been the end but we don't know well we have we have writings from people who lived at that time who tell us that is what happened that's where we get that idea the fact that we don't have an official official histories written about this is because Paul was not seen by society at that point. I mean, by Christians he was, but Christians were a tiny little minority. Mm -hmm. He was not seen as being of any importance. He was one more person who got tried and convicted and beheaded in Rome amongst millions. But what about Luke and Peter and all of those guys? I mean, wasn't there somebody that would have been still alive at that time to be able to say? Luke, I don't know about. Peter, we have the same kind of records. We have record that Peter was crucified. Tradition says he was crucified upside down in Rome during the Neronian persecutions. Just like we have record, uh, we have the tradition of writings that says that Paul, uh, very near the same time, was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen in Rome during the Neronian persecutions. So we have as much story about that. I mean, they didn't have newspapers, they didn't have computers, they couldn't send an e email blast out to tell everybody 
Did you hear what happened to Paul? So the fact that we don't have record is a more specific historical record is because the kind of thing that we think of as being official historical record, you know, there was no obituary published because there was no place to put it. And so we don't have more, but we have a lot. You know, we probably have as much as we do for most historical figures down through history. And if you say, well, why wasn't there more recorded about that? Because Christianity was such a minority, and those who were, who were strong advocates of Christianity and missionaries and evangelists were seen by society at that time as being bad influences and negative characters. And so there was no desire to keep track of what happened to them. Yeah, but why not, why not in the book somewhere? I mean, like, we have this history, we have a story, we have all these things, and then poof. I mean, there are people who say things, yes, but couldn't anybody have put it? Wasn't there anything that had come down through the New Testament scriptures that would have clarified this? We don't have the story of, of hardly... John the Baptist, James the Just, the, uh, James the, the, the Greater, the, the uh, brother of John. Stephen, Stephen, we know about how they died. Right. But one of the reasons is because they died so early. The people who died, I mean, the, the history book of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts, Luke and Acts, that's the history part. The, the other things that we learn like from, about Paul's travels from Paul's writings are just incidental. That's not the point of them being written. That wasn't the focus of those. The history part of it was completed at a certain point. And like we say, we feel like that Luke, there's the suggestion Luke might have been intending to write something else because he's so abrupt after having been so comprehensive and complete in finishing everything before that. And yet, that has not come down to us. So, there's no, there's no other place naturally that that would have occurred in terms of any kind of historical reporting. And, and we can't, our early 21st century expectations for how things ought to be recorded and done simply don't fit with 2,000 years ago. It was a very different way of thinking about things. It's why it's so unusual that Paul, when he writes his letters, he identifies himself as being the author of them. Even the other New Testament writers, for the most part, don't do that because that simply wasn't typical. You didn't keep track of this. People say, well, why don't we know exactly when Jesus was born? Because people didn't really care about that sort of thing back then. They didn't pay attention to that. You know, we'd celebrate December 25th is because when Gregory the Great came along and said, we need to do something to reach more pagans, let's take the pagan festivals and celebrations and make those the dates we celebrate Christian events. And since they didn't know when Jesus was born, let's, they said, let's take the winter solstice, you know, into December, and make that when Jesus was born, just stamp it, because that way we'll take some of the thunder away from the people who are worshiping the pagan gods at the winter solstice. And why? Because nobody really kept track of when people were born back then. They didn't. And that was true even with a lot of major officials in the Roman Empire. We don't know for sure when they were born either. So... You know, it's, it, we, we have to be careful. We're not taking our modern kinds of ideas about how it ought to be done and trying to apply it back then. And it wasn't just the Christian stuff that we would have trouble with. It was true for everybody. John? Well, it, it doesn't seem, you know, out of the, out of the ordinary when you, you, you look at Paul and you, and you cannot explain his past and how he died and that sort of thing with, cert, with a certitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do see that his legacy outlived his life and death. And the same way with Moses. I mean, Moses, he went up on the mountain and saw the land, and, and he died, and God buried him. And the Bible says to this day, nobody we don't know where it buried him. You know? So yeah. there's that element of mystery as well. Yeah. But I, I think the main thing is, and I should have said this earlier, let's, not, let's make sure we don't take our modern idea about how things ought to be recorded and history done and everything else and try to apply it retroactively two millennia ago, because nobody was doing it that way. But back then they had stories that, you know, I mean, that's... And we have those! Okay. <laughs> we do! You know, we, we have the writers from the same period of time who tell us what happened, but the fact that, you know, the only thing is it's not in the Bible. Okay. Any other questions?